welcome to First Christian Church. We are glad you are here with us this morning. And uh, glad that you're here uh, with us on our family Sunday where we all, as a family, get to worship together. Our kids from upstairs come down. Our, our blast ministry, our nursery through our sixth grade comes down. And uh, they get to showcase some of the things that they're doing. And uh, I'll preach a little bit from what they're learning about. So uh, today's a good day. And uh, we're glad you are here with us. And uh, if you're still kind of uh, pilfering in, um, in your bulletins is the, if you grab the bulletin, uh, is our kind of our upcoming events and our camp schedule and different things like that. Um, just to give you a heads up, um, our Bible study will not meet this week uh, because the men are going over to Pine Haven Christian Children's Ranch because that's where the uh, uh, ladies were at this last weekend and they had a wonderful time. So uh, the men get to go this week. And uh, so men, if you uh, signed up for it and you're one of the, one of the guys going, uh, we're leaving at 8 o'clock in the morning on Thursday. So... I'm looking forward to that, and uh, we'll load up and we'll, we'll head over that way. Our starts at noon, and uh, ladies' one started at like five or something, six. So, but in your bullets, you can see what's going on there. Next Sunday is again. This is the first Sunday of the month. So, what's that mean? Uh, that's right. So, we're, my kids are excited about it apparently. So. Um, <laughs> If you uh, want to join in that, or if you forget, that's okay too. Um, but um, we ask that if you want to come and participate and join in that, that you would uh, bring a dish to share. We would love for you to, to come and fellowship and be a part of that as well. And then uh, that following Monday, the Sisterhood have a meeting. Uh, you ladies, you know what that's going on there. So, And then um, here shortly, moms, you get a day of your own, right? You know, a day where you don't have to serve us us men, right? <laughs> I, I, I thought I'd get a little bit of kick out of that, right? So, um, But it's where we like to celebrate uh, uh, moms and grandmas and aunts and, and women who've been like moms in our lives. And um, so uh, I know I have a few, and I'm sure you do too, um, that way as well. So... But anyway, uh, that's what's going on. Uh, the kids are going to come up here in a minute and kind of showcase some of the things that they're doing. They're going to sing some songs. Um, we're going to we're going to have communion time. One of our elders is going to do communion time. And during our communion time, I'm going to explain it now. Our tray has cups in it, and they're stacked on top of each other. It's, there's bread, and then there's juice on top. If you want to want to partake in the Lord's Supper, well, you just take one cup. And it's a it's two you know two and one okay so and then you take it apart and there's the bread and the juice okay so uh, and then you spend some time meditating and then uh, you, you take it as you, you feel led to um, but other than that uh, let me pray and then I'm gonna hand it over to Miss Denise and uh, there she's gonna invite the kids to come up and all kinds of stuff so let's let's pray God I just come to you to thank you for this day I thank you for the wonderful blessing of sunshine and growth and, and, and green grass and, Lord, just all that you allow this spring to blossom and, and get our souls vibrant again, Lord, because sometimes winters can be long. And so, Lord, we just thank you for uh, the, the new life that is outside that is, is waking all of us up. And, Lord, we just pray that you'd be with us today as we, we celebrate you and as we celebrate um, our kids and, and the ministry that goes on upstairs, Lord. And, Father, that you would help us to, to always be open to your word and what you'd have to teach us, Father. We just pray that you would be with us today, be with those that, that can't be with us. And, Lord, we just pray that you'd bring us all back together again, um, if not tomorrow, if not, not next week, but maybe we'll see each other sometime this week, Lord. We do love you, and thank you for your son, Jesus. His name we pray. Amen. So what do you need? Preschool through sixth grade kids, if you want to come up and sing and um, dance and show off some of your talents, and uh, we sure would love to have you up here. Your talent is muscles. <laughs> Alright, I'm going to get out of the way. and. Uh,
Scriptures through songs, they're learning scriptures through their lessons, they're learning uh, how to how to be friends and have fellowship and all, all different things. And so I just, you know, we, we like to kind of show you what's going on um, so that way you can have confidence going in and saying, hey, so-and-so, we got this really awesome church we want to invite you to, you know, if, if it's a friend who has kids, you know, you don't have to worry about that. If it's a friend who has babies, we have a nursery upstairs, you know, we, you know, you don't have to worry about inviting them, and that's what we want you to be able to see, and uh, also uh, allow our volunteers to have a break upstairs and different things like that. But but we want you to invite with confidence, knowing that that we have this place that that we can be together and fellowship together in all aspects, from from babies all the way up to to seniors. And uh, we want you to, again to be able to invite with confidence anybody that you want to invite. So. Um, I love watching the kids, you know, do their thing, you know, a lot of you know that I was a youth minister for 14 years, and I miss them a little bit, but um, Denise has got a heart of gold, she's willing to step in and volunteer and do it, and, uh, so I really, really do appreciate that, and I, I hope you, you appreciate that too, so, um, but anyway, I want to pray, uh, you'll, you'll know on the back of your bulletins that there are prayer, prayer and praise time, uh, normally we, we offer a time where you can share um, today's a little bit different, uh, but we want you to know that that's something that we do too. And, uh, you know, you can bring, bring your prayers and petitions to us as a congregation, and, and we can pray together as a, as a family and share in that. So um, that's normally what this time is reserved for. But let me pray for those things today and uh, pray for what's on your heart today. God, I just come to you to thank you for um, what you do in our lives. Lord, we just thank you so much for this chance to come together as family and to lift each other up. Lord, I know there's burdens and there's sicknesses and there's um, different things that go on in our lives of, of kids and grandkids and nieces and nephews. And Lord, everything that, that, that we worry about in this life, I pray that you'd help us to, to not worry about those things. Lord, that we would allow you to work in their lives and allow you to... Uh, let your will happen, Lord, no matter what it is. And Father, we just pray for your, your strength in our lives, and we pray for your guidance as we go forward and to try to live for you in all that we do. Lord, we thank you so much for the ministries that, that go on around this church. And Lord, I pray that you would lay upon our hearts to invite people to, to have an introduction to church, um, that, that we might invite people to maybe maybe into a, a, a conversation with us about you. And Lord, just give us the courage and the boldness to do that, to share you with whoever we come in contact with. Lord, we do thank you so much for loving us. And we thank you for sending Jesus to, to the cross for our sin. And Lord, that he paid the price with his life and his blood. Lord, the, but he didn't stay there. Lord, the resurrection is, is what we celebrate, knowing that, that we get to spend eternity with you through your son, Jesus. I pray that you'd help us to look into that, lean into that, 
And thank you for all, all things that you do in our lives. Lord, we love you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. At this time, we're going to have a communion song, and then we'll have an elder come up and share with you a short, short uh, devotion. Christian Church in Terre Haute, Indiana. Suffering and sorrow stink. Pain, whether physical, emotional, or spiritual, is seemingly ever-present in our lives, and there often is no good way to deal with it. It never passes quickly enough. Some pain never diminishes. The death of a loved one gives birth to intense and enduring pain. Philip Yancey explained that God gave us memories of those who are absent from this life as a gift to help with the pain. The weakness of our memories is the best weapon we have to combat the pain of loss. Memory is limited, but memory also is a wonderful gift. A few hours before his betrayal, Jesus revealed what was about to happen to his closest followers. Jesus understood not only the pain he would endure, but also the agony with which his followers would, re would wrestle. John recorded Jesus' consoling words to his followers. I tell you the solemn truth. You will weep and wail, but the world will rejoice. You will be sad, but your sadness will turn into joy. When a woman gives birth, she has distress because her time has come. But when her child is born, she no longer remembers the suffering because of her joy that a human being has been born into the world. So also you have sorrow now, but I will see you again and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy away from you. John chapter 16, verses 20 through 22. 
John didn't say whether the conversation took place before or after Jesus passed the loaf and the cup, but there came a time later, after Pentecost, when the apostles put all the pieces together, Jesus' death, their sorrow, his resurrection, and an unquenchable joy. The memory of those days of horror at the loss, followed by the weeks of joy in Jesus' presence, again helped them connect Jesus' sacrifice to the bread and the cup. The apostles passed on to us the same emblems to remember their witness of sorrow and joy. When we focus on their stories of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, God builds in us not only joy like theirs, but also hope in another resurrection that is to come. Remember Jesus, alive and loving, as you partake of these emblems. Shall we go to the Lord in prayer? Our Heavenly Father, we, we thank you that we have memories. We thank you for the history that has been written and passed down through the generations to us of what you did for us, what Jesus did for us, what the disciples did. Lord, we are so thankful for this time when we partake of those emblems that Jesus set aside that evening that we might remember his sacrifice, the fruit of the, the, fruit of the cup that represents the blood that he shed on that cross to cover the sins of the world, and the loaf which represents his body which hung on that cross as an atonement for the sins of the world. As we partake, I just pray that we might examine ourselves, that we might remember the agony that Jesus went through. How do we explain what God allowed his only begotten son to go through for us? The death and, and, and the agony. But he knew that it was worth it in order for mankind to be saved. Lord, as we partake of these emblems, help us to examine ourselves <coughs> to try to rectify the areas where we fall short of your expectations. Help us to see Jesus on that cross, the agony that he went through, but also help us remember that on the third day, he resurrected from the grave. He walked with his disciples. Their sorrow turned to joy, for they knew that he had fulfilled the prophecies, that he would resurrect on the third day. He is alive and and living. And we just pray that we <coughs> might remember that, the promises that he gave to us as we partake of these emblems, that we too can have everlasting life if we accept him as Lord and Savior. Lord, be with us today as we partake of these emblems. Guide us and lead us in the week to come. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.
Good morning again. So, um, our Blast Kids, they um, have been exploring this uh, series called Unexplored Bible Stories, okay? And they, they, they learn the relevance of, of how to apply Scripture to their lives today from these seemingly stories that, that we don't hear a lot, right? And so, so to start today, I want, I want to give you five questions. If you know me, you know that I love the Bible and I love studying it. And I love finding things in there that sometimes make, make you go, hmm, okay? And, uh, but I want to ask you five questions today that would be obscure Bible knowledge, okay? Now, you're going to have to dig deep into your Sunday school Bible study knowledge bank to solve some of these, okay? Because... There's a lot of the Bible that goes unexplored, okay? And the kids are up there trying to discover some of these things. And some of you might know these. Again, there are only five questions. Some of you might sit there and go, hmm, I've never heard of that, okay? And so, all right, let, let me ask you. And if you, and if you know it uh, and you want to shout it out, that's fine with me. But this is an interaction time, okay? All right, here we go. God took away the sanity of a king in the Bible. That king ate grass like an ox. His hair grew like feathers of an eagle, and his nails like the claws of a bird. Hey, all right. That was an easy one, okay? Now, only one, uh, if you didn't hear it, it was Nebuchadnezzar, okay? That's exactly the way the Bible describes it, okay? Number two, only one of Solomon's wives is named in Scripture. He had technically 700, okay? <coughs> Nama is her name, and only one of Solomon's many children is identified. Do you know who that child is? Hmm. This one you got to dig deep. <laughs> one child's name of Solomon's, of his many. Rehoboam. Okay. First Kings chapter 12. If you want to be turning your Bibles, that's where we're going to be today. We're going to learn a little bit about Rehoboam today. Number three, who was the teenager that got bored and fell asleep and he fell out the window to his death only to be resurrected by Paul? Do you know his name? What's that? It does start with an E. I told you you got to dig deep on some of these, right? It's a weird name. It's sort of like eucalyptus. Eutychus. Eutychus was his name. I guarantee nobody in the room is going to get this one. I didn't even know this one, okay? <laughs> Who was the only woman to sit on the throne of Judah? She was a queen of, of Israel. What's that? Nope. She's queen of Persia. Yeah, I, I can't even say this one. Athaliah was her name, okay? Look that one up if you want. It's A-T-H-A-L-I-A-A. -A -A -A. She reigned like seven years. All right, this last one you probably will get, okay? What type of wood did Noah use to build the ark? Does she know? Gopher wood is absolutely correct. Good job. So the Bible is full of... Yeah, I know <laughs> the Bible is full of stories and history of God's deliverance for his people, provisions for people, salvation for people. It, it, it's full of our sin, people's sin. And there's, there's many, many more things that go on in Scripture. And, and we have to, to, to read that Scripture and identify it. And we find these things that happen in Scripture that we didn't know were sometimes there. Maybe like a few of those questions, okay? And we don't hear much about it. You don't hear many preachers preaching about a woman named Athaliah sitting on the throne of Judah for like seven years, do you? I, honestly, I could say I've been a Christian for 20, 28 years now, and I've never heard a sermon preached on her. So we'll, we'll, just, we'll just call it that, okay? And why do we do that? 
we sometimes, you know, we glaze right over them because we don't necessarily think, you know, it's not necessarily intentional, but we do it because we don't think it makes much sense or, or we, we, we think we already know it or it just seems insignificant. I don't know how many times I've read through a scripture and, and I, I've, you know, gotten something from it. And then like a year later, I'll come back and I read that same scripture again and I go, oh, I didn't know that was there. Right? Think, think, about, think about it like this. If you watch movies, if you like movies, right? You might watch a movie and you think it's a really cool movie and you've, you've caught it all. And then you go back and watch it again because you like it so much and you're like, hey, I missed that. Huh, I've never seen that before. Sometimes there's little Easter eggs or sometimes there's little things that they miss in, in cutting of the movie or there's just things that happen in the story of the movie, right, that we miss. Maybe because it was insignificant at the time or we weren't paying attention to it, right? I think scripture is the same way. Scripture acts sometimes the same way, but, but I also think it's God working in our lives, right? You know, we might read a certain set of scripture at, at a certain point in our life and, and God speaks to us through it. And then we're in a different place sometime later. And God is speaking to us through it again in a different way, right? Now, one thing we got to never forget is what, what Paul tells Timothy about Scripture. In 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17, he tells us that all Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God, who is supposed to be a Christian, may be thoroughly equipped for every good work, right? All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training us, right? And sometimes throughout scripture, we see things happening, and we see these people that we can relate to, right? And again, the writer of Hebrews tells us, in Hebrews 12, 1, tells us that we are surrounded by a great cloud of witness. Let us throw off everything that hinders us, right? And, let, and the sin that easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance, the race marked out for us. And what the writer of Hebrews is talking about, he says, therefore, Hebrews chapter 11 talks about all the heroes of faith that we, we read about in Scripture. Moses, Abraham, you know, all, all, of these, all of these people that we read about. And he says we're surrounded by these people uh, of great witness, right, of great faith. And that was a long time ago. I don't know about you, but there's been people in this lifetime, this generation, that have been great witnesses of faith, right, that we can look to. And, and, and he says, let us throw it all off. Let us throw off the sin and the, the stuff that drags us down because of them, because of, of what, how they've lived. And we can look at that and see how, how important it is to live for God, right? And we can run that course that's marked out for us, right? I can tell you that examples are all around us. Kids, you need to listen to this. Examples are all around us. People. Trials. And there's so much more. But I believe one of the most important things that God gives up, all of us is people. The people who lived the faith. Right? The people who, who stood in the face of adversity and trials and, and, and could, could learn from that and know that. I don't know about you, but when I was growing up, I had a hard time listening to, to people. But as I grow older... I begin to see the value and the wisdom in that. And the Bible is full of it. Let me pray, and then we'll jump in a little bit deeper. God, I just come to you to, to thank you for this day. Thank you for the chance to be together again as family and to learn from your word. Lord, open our hearts and our minds to what you would tell us this day. Lord, may we see you today and hear your voice. Lord, we thank you for your word. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. The jungle. It's an ever-changing landscape. It, it changes when storms happen and, and trees get blown down and, and it mixes everything up, knocks over paths. <clears throat> it also changes with floods. It, <coughs> excuse me. It changes as the, the brush grows up and vines, vines kind of take back over the earth and it grows and it spreads, right? 
And if we, and if we grab a map and we see this jungle and we see how, how, where the path is supposed to be at, it's a little bit easier. And that's not always foolproof, is it? We, we would do well if we had someone to guide us who knew the ever-changing landscape, right? A guide would be important. Yeah? yeah. Okay, thanks. <laughs> All right. But also there's helpful tools that, that we can have to guide those things, like a compass, we would know what direction we're going. A GPS, a GPS would be fantastic, right? But even in those certain parts of the jungles, you know, it, sometimes that stuff doesn't work. But what, what we begin to learn is someone who knows and who's been there and who's studied it and who's, who's lived it, right? We, we see how quickly it, it can be advantageous to have somebody that knows the way. Because if we go out there by ourselves, even with those tools, sometimes we can get lost. It's helpful to have those people that have been there. I can tell you that, that being lost in a jungle, not personally, it would probably be a very scary thing, okay? I, I've been in a wilderness before, not a jungle, you know, where, where tigers are going to eat me or anything, but in the wilderness where, you know, the, the wildlife could still kill you, right? But, but we understand that we talk about this world and, and kind of the, the navigation of it in our, in our Christian lives. We talk about how sometimes this world can be a jungle, right? And, and without that guidance, we can easily get lost. Think about, think about the older, as the older you get, from the time that you were a kid to the older that you get, right? You, you, you think about all the stuff that has happened in this life and in this world, and, and it feels eerily like a jungle. And every year that we are alive brings new challenges, new temptations, for kids, you have you have peer pressures that you deal with on a daily basis. You know, uh, should I do this or should I do that? You want to go along with the crowd because you don't want to be a standout. You know, and, and we're called to stand out as followers of God. We're called to, to be holy, to be set apart, to be different. And as the older we get and the older you kids get, the stakes get higher, don't they? Consequences tend to get bigger if we if we get lost. You know, you think back when you were in kindergarten or first grade, right? You you, you broke broke little rules, right? You might have to sit out at recess if you did something wrong, right? Because your your friends your friends were making fart noises in kindergarten or first grade, right? And you decided to go along with your friends, and and a teacher caught you and. You have to sit out at recess, right? You know, little things like that, right? But as you got older, by, by the time you get to fourth, fifth, sixth grade, you know, some of those things are getting bigger. Some of those, some of those peer pressure things are getting bigger. What do your friends challenge you to do? You know, what, what rules do they challenge you to break? And as you got into high school and into college, and you got into your first job, what were you willing to do? To get ahead. What were you willing to do to surpass those behind you to get ahead in a career? How, ask yourself, how did you navigate the jungle of all this, right? How did you get through those challenges? Because you know what? When we look at the rest of the world, when we look, look back and look at the world, or we're looking at the world today, what's it tell you to do? It tells you to go out and get, get ahead in life at, every, at any cost. At any cost. And it doesn't matter what the ever-changing landscape is, as, what is, as long as what is acceptable to you. That's what the world's telling us. And if we don't have someone who can help us, or someone, something that can help guide us, right? God gives us many forms of guidance, right? He gives us, he gives us tools that are ready. And, and they're, they're all, all pretty good tools that God gives us. But I think the best one he gives us is that great cloud of witness that we can turn to. Those people that have been there, those people that have gone through it, those people that can help us understand what God's word says. Kids, Think about it. It's people like your parents, your Sunday school teachers, 
Adults who walk in those shoes. Adults. Maybe we would do well to listen to, to advice from someone who's already traveled that road in this life. Sometimes they've been down that road. Because there's roads that, that some people go down and get lost for a long time. And then they find their way to Jesus. And they, they can tell you that they've been down this road. They know the pitfalls and the dangers that come from it. And can I tell you that God's word is full of broken people that turn back to him? Right? The ones that have, have, have done the wrong thing, that are now doing the right thing, that, that are doing what God wants them to do. But I want, I want us to see this, this scripture in 1 Kings 12. It's verses 1 through 17 is what we're going to read. Ray Boehm Solomon's son gets some advice, some wise advice, and he refuses to listen. Instead, he listens to his entourage that is around him. I don't know how many of you have ever, ever seen uh, these pro athletes and these, these young pro athletes that end up getting a lot of money and they have this big entourage around them. It never usually is a good thing. They usually end up getting into trouble and different, different things, right? But in your Bibles, if you're there in 1 Kings chapter 12, let's read verses 1 through 17. Rehoboam went to Shechem, for all the Israelites had gone there to make him king. When Jeroboam, son of Nebat, heard this, he was still in Egypt, where he had fled from King Solomon. He returned from Egypt. So they sent for Jeroboam, and the whole assembly of Israel went to Rehoboam and said to him, Your father put a heavy yoke on us. But now, lighten the harsh labor and heavy yoke he put on us, and, he, and we will serve you. Rehoboam answered, Go away for three days, and then come back to me. So the people went away. Then King Rehoboam consulted the elders who had served his father Solomon during his lifetime. How would you advise me to answer these people, he asked. They replied, If today you will be a servant, hold on to that, if you will be a servant to these people and serve them and give them a favorable answer, they will always be your servants. But Rehoboam rejected the advice of the elders gave him and consulted the young men who had grown up with him and were serving him. He asked them, what is your advice? How should we answer these people who say to me, lighten the yoke your father put on us? Get this in verse 10. The young men who had grown up with him replied, Tell these people who have said to you, your father has put a heavy yoke on us, but make our yoke lighter. Tell them, my little finger is thicker than my father's wrist. My father laid on you a heavy yoke, I will make it even heavier. My father scourged you with whips, I will scourge you with scorpions. Three days later, Jeroboam and all the people returned to Rehoboam as the king had said. Come back to me in three days. The king answered to the people harshly, rejecting the advice given him by the elders. The following advice the follow advice the young man had said. We'll stop there. It goes on to tell the rest of the story there. Rehoboam was a direct descendant of King David. Okay? One of the greatest kings that, that, that we see in the Old Testament. And he was the, uh, Rehoboam was the son of Solomon. A man still known as the wisest king who ever lived. Okay? David, the Bible tells us, did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. Okay, even though he had missteps along the way, God still blessed him, okay, because he always returned to the Lord. When God offered Solomon anything he asked for, Solomon asked for wisdom. And because of Solomon's correct answer, God blessed him as well, even though he wasn't perfect as well. And you would think with an ancestry like that, of, of a legacy like that, Rehoboam would have been like, this is easy, right? I just, I just listen to the guys who've been there, who, 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 who've done that and who've been all over that. But did you see what he did? He refused their advice. And when he refused their advice, Rehoboam changed the history of Israel forever. It wasn't just a, a, a decision at, at that moment that, that changed the moment that they were in, but it changed the course of Israel forever. 
Because what happened after this, the kingdom went on to be divided. The kingdom split in two. It put them at odds at each other. And they fought. And they were uh, not, not, they didn't protect each other. And what it ended up causing the nation of Israel to do was sin in the eyes of the Lord. They turned away from God because of all of the harshness and the evil that was going on in the kingdom. And it was because what Rehoboam had done. He refused to set the whole course of Israel on the right trajectory, but instead chose to take them down a path of darkness because he refused the advice of people that God had, had put on their hearts to give them. He chose to get lost in sin. Now, you might see this and go, he's just a stupid young kid. He was a young king. And you might think, well, if that's his fault, he's got to learn from his mistakes, blah, 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 whatever, right? But can I tell you that, that we have an opportunity in our lives where God puts those people in our lives, those guys in our lives, who can speak into it because they've been in those shoes, they've been there, they've done that, right? And they're trying to point us to say, no, that's the way, kid. You need to go that way. You see, God puts those people in our lives. We must never be arrogant and refuse that advice. Because there's always something good in sometimes the advice that people give us. I was told a long time ago to take the, the, the good advice with the bad advice and to, to, to compare it to, to what God is saying, right? Because there's sometimes it will, people that will speak into your lives, it's, it's just terrible advice, right? But there's also times that people will speak good into our lives, righteousness into our lives, the truth into our lives. But we've got to be able to compare that to God's word. The, the true guide, right? We've got to be able to take that advice and, and, and pull from it. Because if we, because <clears throat> if we refuse to listen to the, to the help that God sends, sometimes those consequences are hard to get out of. I want to share a story with you that I heard a long time ago. It's about a, about a flood. You might have heard it's called two bullets in a helicopter. Okay? A storm descends on a small town, and the downpour soon turns into a flood. The waters rise, and the local preacher kneels in prayer at the church. And as it starts to surround him, as the water starts to surround him, by and by the townsfolk are coming by and telling him up the street in canoes are saying, Hey, preacher, you better get in. He says, no, I have faith in the Lord. He will save me. The waters continue to rise. Now the preacher goes up on the second floor balcony, and he's standing there, and, and, and he's wringing his hands, and, and, he's, and he's praying to God, and, and a guy on a motorboat comes by and says, preacher, get in. The levee's about ready to break. He says, no, I'm going to pray that God will save me. Well, the levee breaks. Floods the town. He goes up to the roof, and he's standing there, and he's praying. He's like, God, why aren't you saving me? And then a helicopter comes by, and he and yelled down to him, Grab the ladder, preacher! He insists, No, the Lord is going to save me! Well, you guessed it. The floods wash his church away, and he perishes. He gets to heaven because he loves Jesus, and he followed Jesus, and he asks God, he said, God! I have unwavering faith. Why wouldn't you save me? God looks at him and says to him, What do you want from me? I sent you two boats and a helicopter. You see, even preachers miss signs sometimes too. Yes, this is a cute little story, but I want you, but it's a but it's a purpose for us to understand that, that God sends us help in various forms. And we have to look at what God is trying to teach us through this. And, and that's the thing he's trying to get to us is that we have to understand about wisdom and that there are two kinds, there's two ways a person can become wise. One's by experience, right? We experience things that have positive or negative consequences and we learn from those experiences, right? And sometimes those experiences can cost us heavily, right? Think, think about someone who... who touches a hot stove, right? Think about someone who rides down a, a hill too fast on a bike without a helmet, right? 
Sometimes there's consequences that are irreparable. Sometimes there's consequences that draw us far away. But this is wisdom that we gain through experience. It's not always good wisdom either. But I want to tell you that God gives us people. Remember Hebrews 12, 1, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witness, there are people in our lives that God has, has, has built up and allowed them to live the faith in front of us, and we've seen it, and, and, and they give us that advice, and we just look at them and say, you're an old, dumb person. I don't know how many times in my life I've, I've thought that a person giving me advice was just an old curmudgeon cruddy-duddy, right? I've spoiled those moments in my life. And I'm standing here as a testimony to you, to these kids, to say we have got to listen to the people that have been there. And we've got to be able to compare it to God's Word. And kids, parents are the first line of defense for you. Honestly, they're the first line of defense for you. And parents, if you're here and you have kids, you are the first line of defense for your kids on instruction and how they should be wise and, and make good choices. We have to give them advice on the way that they should go and, and help them in their failures. Adults, there are people that have been in your shoes or possibly been down the road that you've been down or, or looking to go down. Think about all the, all the people God has, has allowed you to have in your life from, from teachers, parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles. There's a great deal of wisdom to be had. This, this world we live in is a jungle that, that is ever-changing. God, God gives us those people as guides. God gives us his word as, as the, the ultimate guide to what is going on in this life. We would do well to listen to wisdom and learn from it. And most importantly, not just learn from it, but use it to go, wait a second, I know, I know that because someone told me, right? Remember, at the end of the day, God gives us these examples of, of these people in our lives. And I want to tell you that if you're at the point in your life where, where you feel like you're a wise sage and you've, you've, you've got nothing more to learn, that's not true either. But you do have valuable wisdom to offer. Are you offering to help guide those? Or do you just watch them fall? Do you just watch them fail, get lost? Well, they deserved it. <coughs> I can tell you it's time for us to get in the fight, folks. It's time for us to, to stand up for these young ones in, in this generation because they need all the help they can get. Because I know you've, you've seen stuff going on in the, in the world, in the media, and in the news. You've seen stuff that's going on. It's time for us to, 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 to be the, the source of guidance with God's word in these, in these young kids' lives. Because God's word reminds us who a fool is and who, who is wise. And I want to share one verse with you that, that sums it all up. Pro, Proverbs 12, 15. The way of a fool's the way of fools seems right to them. The way of fools seems right to them. They don't care what anybody else says as long as it's right in their heart. But the wise listen to advice. Let me pray. God, I just come to you to thank you for this day. Lord, I know you've put many examples in our lives that, that we can look to of people, of events, that sometimes experience good and bad, Lord. I pray for us as, as adults, as we have the responsibility to live a righteous life for you, to, to point people to you. And Lord, we're living in a generation that is, is getting hard for these young kids to navigate. It's easily get, they easily get lost. I pray that you'd help us to, to stand firm on your word and your truth. Lord, help us to, to always turn back to you. Lord, as we see the advice Rehoboam was given in your word, and he refused it. 
He caved to the pressures of his friends. He refused to listen to those people that have been there and done that. Lord, I pray that you, we would see that. And Lord, we might be willing to, to be open to listen to those people that have been there and done that. Lord, we might compare their advice to your word. Father, thank you for loving us. And thank you for your son, Jesus. And then we pray. Amen. Thank you for being here today. Um, as always, this is, this is Family Sunday, and we want to have, have you to have the confidence to invite whoever it is to our church so that they might have an introduction to church or Jesus for the first time. So um, have a great week. May you be blessed and filled up, and go and love God and love others. Have a great week, everyone. Thank <laughs> you.